Hello, welcome back, welcome back to where I talk about variant tabletop role-playing game rules. This is all about complex combat mechanics today. Um, there will be obviously some shots of maps, miniatures and dice because I will do a bit of demonstration while I also will be jumping to my, my face cam so you can actually see me um, as I sort of break down the pros and cons of doing certain things. I'm going to put up a poll, feel free to take part in that poll. Uh, and also to grab some food, some drink, make sure you're comfortable, and we'll get started into this as, uh, as soon as I can. Um, I have prepared material for today, and some of these ideas you may have come across before. Uh, a lot of these ideas you may not have come across before, and I'm hoping this will be uh, valuable to you. For those of you who are trying to incorporate variant rules or home brewing your own house rules in some way. So let's get started, shall we? Hi, welcome to How to RPG. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about role-playing games. It could be Dungeons and Dragons, could be Pathfinder, it really doesn't matter. So one of the, the first things I want to say is when it comes to complex combat mechanics, I'm really talking about stuff outside of making an attack, okay, uh, movement on the, on the battlefield, things like that. So we're going the next step. It's the additional stuff that you would need to, to incorporate in some way. But the essentials, the basics around combat, is usually the attack roll and movement. And then anything else is kind of extra, really. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a number of different concepts to you today. What I want to cover first is cover. So I'll talk a little bit more about cover than obscurity. I will talk about obscurity, but I'll talk more about the focuses for me cover rules right so when you're standing behind something and you're getting cover of some kind the other thing that i want to delve into and it's not a very popular topic and that is inspiration or inspiration points they're also often called action points or hero points or uh, in some cases some systems you might call it a fate point there's a lot of different you know there's a lot of different verbiage around that and so i want to cover that as well for today <clears throat> So let's, let's go straight into cover, and then we'll follow up with the inspiration stuff. So one of the first things I always found interesting when it comes to cover rules is, um, right now, your battlefield is dependent on your environment, right? And so your first thing is you have cover here. So cover would be, you know, these trees here, or the, the rocks would provide cover. Um, maybe the headstones of these 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 uh, graves would provide a bit of cover. So cover is different. So, some cover is better than others. But one of the things I would really like to highlight to people who are looking at modifying and changing their, their cover rules for their, their game, and that is there's actually a lot of people who don't use cover rules. And it's perfectly fine not to use cover. So, for example, something like Dungeons and Dragons 5e. When I started playing and game mastering Dungeons and Dragons 5e, I didn't use the cover rules, which meant that there were certain feats that did not get didn't did not apply. Like you know, a Sharpshooter really there was no point taking Sharpshooter in a game that I ran initially when I was first starting out because it was an extra thing for me to think about, so I just left it alone. And there's a lot of game masters, dungeon masters, who do that. In fact, I know people today who still run 5e and other game systems and they don't use cover rules. They just ignore it. They decide they don't want that level of complexity. I think one of the first things you realize when you've played in a group with people where everybody is a game master and everybody takes turns being a game master, which is my own home group, the first thing that you start to learn about rules is everybody will adjudicate them differently. So, so everybody in my group, for example, every game master runs the rules slightly different to somebody else. So that means we have to adjust and adapt to each game master every single time. And when you wind up doing that, you start to realize that being attached and there has to be a particular way of doing something really is not very important. <clears throat> so how you run your cover rules in your game is none of my business and frankly shouldn't be anybody else's business. Um, it's down to what level of complexity can the game master handle? Not the players, but 
usually most of the work winds up falling on a, a game master or a dungeon master when it comes to cover rules to adjudicate and decide what's going to be appropriate. So it's always down to when it comes to complexity of combat rules, what level of complexity is uh, the game master or dungeon master can they deal with or you deal with if you are a game master. It is never about what the players are doing because if the game master can adjudicate it, then it's going to work. If they can't and it's too much for the manage, it won't work and you won't you wind up using it. So that's the first thing is you don't need to use cover rules. Okay, let's actually talk about some cover rules rather than the fact that you don't have to have them. <laughs> but I wanted to point that out right now. There's a difference between cover and obscurity in a battle and it's um, it's a slightly different mechanic. So when I say cover, cover provides like a solid hard um, section of terrain, right? So you're dealing with something that's actually got some physical um, matter to it. It provides protection for, a, say, a character. One of these characters could stand behind a stone. That provides them with some protection. Uh, the monsters could be standing behind a, a forest or wooded area like this. That provides them with some, some cover, okay? They might be in the wooded area, and that also provides them with cover because there's something solid. It's making a hit from an attack or a spell or some sort of effect much harder uh, to uh, to actually uh, cause any damage. That's your first thing. But obscurity is different again, okay? Obscurity is not quite as useful as cover because it doesn't provide protection. It's not actually creating a physical barrier between uh, your character or your monster. Instead, it's just making the target harder to detect. So... If we have everything out here, but it's now dark, darkness would be, say, you know, pretty, pretty, it's going to obscure your ability to see the enemy in some way. And as long as you don't have dark vision or you don't have a light source, so darkness would be a good one. Fog, uh, rain, you know, drizzle of some kind, uh, a blizzard would obscure your vision. Okay, makes it harder for you to see and hear. So that's the difference between them. And there are various levels of cover and obscurity that you can use. And I, I think probably the easiest way to sort of understand um, cover and breaking it up is traditionally we've had really two types of partial cover that you would use in your game. The first one being like half cover. So uh, an example might be, in this case, you cover half the body. So I've got a dice here. Uh, that little dice there probably provides about half cover for this uh, this character. But if I put a second dice in front, say equivalent of two crates, now instead of half cover, we've got three quarters cover. Half cover being you're covering about half the body, three quarters cover being you, th you cover about three quarters of the body. And most systems kind of work that way. And then there's another one which is essentially you cover the entire thing and you can't see them at all, which is... It's not a partial cover, it's total cover, okay? And these concepts have been used in Dungeons & Dragons for a long time and role-playing games. And then a low and heavy obscurity, the difference between uh, just a foggy environment would be, say, low obscurity, and then heavy obscurity would be darkness, where you can't see anything. In fog, you can see something, depending on how thick it is, and then darkness, absolutely nothing, okay? Because you don't have dark vision, for example. So there's a couple of ways that they've used um, cover, and this is the, these are the ones I want to sort of go over. I think probably the, the first thing I, I'd like to mention is, it I always find it interesting that we break it up into three categories of cover. Like we have half cover, three quarters cover, and total cover. And most game systems tend to do this. But there are a few out there that just use two, and that is partial cover and total cover. Partial cover is you've got some part of your body that makes it harder for you to be hit. And total cover is you can't be seen at all. And that simplifies the whole process completely. And we're going to go back to this. There's a point where I'm bringing this up because um, I'm going to put forward an idea for those of you who are still playing uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5e or playing a different system. I'm going to put forward a suggestion to you to simplify your cover rules for those of you who want to have cover but want to eliminate some of the complexity. Anyway. Okay, so back to what I was trying to say. <clears throat> so let's look at the different ways you could do that. Num numerical bonuses is probably the first one. I'm going to suggest numerical bonuses of, say, a 
a one, a plus one, or a plus two. We could have a, a plus four. These are quite common, these sort of bonuses. You might even decide to have a, instead of a plus four, you might have a plus five. And I have seen benefits or bonuses for cover that go as high as 10, like literally uh, um, plus 10 to your, your cover. Now, you, what you're doing is the numerical bonus gets added to the armor class or the armor defense or the defensive um, aspect of your character and when you are behind some sort of partial cover. And our numerical value allows us to differentiate the different types of partial cover we have. Numerical bonuses can easily be forgotten uh, when dealing with cover, I find. Uh, it, it's very easy unless the game master is paying attention or the players are paying attention. And quite often I find that if the game master doesn't pay attention all the time to what is actually going to provide cover, it's going to get lost. The only time it doesn't get lost is when the players have cover and it's beneficial for them to have that cover bonus. But when the monsters have a cover bonus and the game master forgets that they, they they do have cover the players will probably not point it out <laughs> it doesn't because it doesn't it doesn't suit them and um, give them the benefit that they want they don't want the the monster to have that cover um, bonus if, if they can help it and it definitely requires more effort I think by a game master to employ bonuses of plus one plus two plus four plus five plus ten to any kind of armor class or defense and this is very apparent when you're playing something like Dungeons and Dragons 5e. The benefit of numerical bonuses is you can cover uh, a wide range of different types of palm partial cover with very small increments or incremental adjustments. So in 5e we have an increment of 2 for half cover and an increment of I believe 5 for partial cover. Uh, if we looked at older versions of the game, it used to be a uh, of D&D, &D, it was at plus one, and then you got a plus two. So you were lo looking at very slight adjustments, not a big adjustment at all. Now, I think part of the reason why there's been a sort of a look at, let's apply cover, a cover bonus where we, we increase the armor class or the defense of a character or a monster is to put more work onto the onto the um, game master, because the game master is probably going to be a bit more honest about when it needs to be applied, rather than leaning onto the players. Now, <laughs> it's not always the case, but I think that's generally the the uh, the approach. It's like, okay, let's ensure that cover gets used, and the person who's really going to be paying attention to this needs to have an easy way of doing that. And if we have two types of partial cover. Uh, the game master can just adjudicate, okay, you get a plus two, or you get a plus five, and uh, and they will add it to their monster if they have the cover, and if they characters have cover, then they will tell them, okay, they get a plus two or plus five to their armor class with, with this attack. Uh, this puts a lot more extra work onto a game master. I'm not really fond of this. It's probably one of the aspects of Dungeons & Dragons 5e that really sort of... Um, talks to the fact that they don't look after the game master very well. They they lean on the game master and their brain so much without making it, you know, a, a little bit easier. Hi Matt, how are you doing? Um, I do often forget cover, uh, but I try when I, I think of it. Yeah, and it's very easy to forget cover. It really is. So one of the reasons why I, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, uh, a plus two or a plus five or a plus one and particularly when it's sort of reliant on the game master to try to remember this, you might be saying, well, it's always going to be like that because ultimately it's always going to be like that, no matter how you approach it. And that's probably very true. Um, but yeah, it's certainly leaning more on the game master to adjudicate that when it comes to cover. So if you are finding yourself overwhelmed, it makes much a lot more sense to have a simpler system or to ditch it completely. Uh, now, the problem with ditching cover or not applying it or is, is that you, you are kind of, I know often you wind up affecting the class features or feats, if there are feats, there are certain feats that would just no longer apply. Uh, there will be certain types of spells that would no longer apply. So yeah, you kind of got to take that into consideration. Okay, um, the next approach, and that is um, quite similar, but on a different, it's from a different angle. And that is where you have a numerical penalty. 
So it might be a, a minus one, it might be a minus two, you might have a minus four. You could in fact have a minus five. And I have definitely seen game systems that apply a minus 10. So you apply this penalty to a, uh, an attack roll. Usually, you know, where you're rolling a 20-sided dice or whatever your attack roll dice was, is going to be. And the, the creature or the character who is targeting somebody else who is behind or in partial cover of some kind, they're going to get that penalty to their attack roll, okay, when they roll that 20-sided dice. Now, Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons 5e uses uh, none of this because this this actually relies more on the mathematics being done by the um, the game master, okay, and the players. But it's probably going to lean more on the players because more often than not, you're going to find that the monsters are in cover because they're ambushing you, because fifty percent of most combat is actually an ambush of some kind. So you'll find that your players are actually having to apply this, this mathematic. A lot of people find it easier to add numbers than to subtract numbers. This is just sort of how people's brains work. So it's not, this is why, this is why the, the, the going thing for 5e is to go with add a number rather than subtract from the number. It's actually very easy to forget to subtract a number and people seem to get that wrong. Even when we're dealing with a minus one, minus two, minus five, minus um, four, okay, minus ten. They're not they're not huge numbers, but people just tend to sort of leave them. Um, <laughs> those of you who are playing currently Pathfinder Second Ed Edition will know that having a minus ten to your attack roll is really really hard to deal with. Like that's that's really rough, and um, it's interesting how. In the past, if you look at, say, Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 and Pathfinder, we were dealing with subtracting or putting a penalty to our attack roll. And yet we are starting to move away from that, where it's not they're not doing that. I, I know that they still do that with Pathfinder 2nd Edition. We're still dealing with minus 10s and stuff like that. That does still, still, it still exists. But it's interesting that there is sort of like a... Why is adding easier for the brain of a human than subtracting? Is it because of the way that people have been taught mathematics? Is it just, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting concept. But obviously this is where it's going. So there's, there's the other approach. It's the same thing. So whether you add a number, a bonus to your armor class or defense, or whether you subtract from the attack roll, it's essentially duplicating the same thing just from a different angle. Okay. Let's have a look at the, the next one that I wanted to present uh, in terms of cover rules. And uh, this one is partial cover. One of the strangest things about Dungeons & Dragons 5e is we have, we have advantage and disadvantage. And you would think if somebody was, whether they had like um, half cover, say this, let's say this is half cover for the... Um, for our, our, our little mage here. And then we have our, our uh, I don't know, warlock here behind these rocks. And this is providing three quarters cover. Okay. You're probably thinking, well, what's, what's the deal? Why can't we just roll with disadvantage? Why can't whoever's trying to attack them? So if we've got somebody throwing javelins at them, why can't, instead of rolling a, a 20-sided dice and adding that bonus of whatever whatever it is, okay, a bugbear, rolling a dice and doing that, why not just roll two 20-sided dice and take the lowest result? It, it's, it's, it's like the simplest way to solve the problem. And you might be saying, well, hang on, here's the problem, Fred. This is why they didn't use that rule. Why they didn't just go with, let's just roll disadvantage whenever there's partial cover and applied, and it's going to be disadvantage for whoever is making the attack. Well, first off, you can't have variations. You can't have half cover and three quarters cover. How can you do that with just two disadvantage dice? You know, two dice and you're having disadvantage. Well, you could add in another dice. Like you could add in a third dice if you're having, say, three quarters cover. So I'm going to suggest to you that actually rolling with disadvantage for both half cover and three quarters cover would just tidy things up completely. 
And in fact, and no matter what system you're playing, whether it be 5e or 4e or 3.5 or whatever other game that you're playing that uses cover and there's an attack roll that uses a 20-sided dice or even any kind of dice that makes an attack roll, like rolling with disadvantage just makes such a, a simple idea. You roll two dice, you take the lowest result. Okay, and if you want to have increments, then allow them to add another dice so you have three dice that you roll for your attack and you take the lowest result off the three dice. And that just cleans everything up. And you're still dealing with you're still dealing with percentages, you're still dealing with um, making it harder. Okay. If somebody's got really good cover, they're gonna be harder to hit. Somebody who's got, you know, cover that's not quite as good, they're gonna be hard to hit, but not as hard as somebody who has got, you know, three quarters cover if you've got half cover. <clears throat> it's it's a weird thing. I, I've come across people who have put this idea forward in the past and it's just not something that I see very often. Nobody really discusses it. Like, why don't we do that? Why don't we just say, we're going to just roll uh, two dice, take the lowest result if you've got half cover and you've got three quarters cover, we'll just roll three dice and you take the lowest result. Or just skip the three dice and just go with every time you do half cover or three quarters cover, um, just roll disadvantage. It's so much easier. There's no adding and subtracting. You're simply taking one number and adding it to the bonus, which you were doing before anyway. Um, I kind of feel like this is where we'll wind up going eventually. I don't know how long it'll take for designers to actually come to the conclusion that that's the easiest way to resolve cover bonuses <laughs> or cover in, the, in your game when you're dealing with combat. But I feel like it will eventually get there. Uh, maybe you'll be the first ones to actually um, try it out. I am still really keen to give it a go myself because the only time you see anything but advantage or disadvantage in 5e, for example, um, is everything else except this one thing, cover rules. <laughs> it's quite strange. I just wanted to point that out. Um, I thought it was, it was an, interesting, um, an interesting development, honestly. And then... I'm not going to go over the 5e rules because, you know, we've kind of discussed this before in the past and I've done videos on it um, till the, the cows go home. But the next topic I really wanted to talk about, and that is inspiration. If anybody had anything they wanted to talk about or discuss or suggestions about cover, please put them forward. I, I'm interested. Um, I'm kind of using today as an opportunity for me to talk about rules and my opinions and different ways of doing things. So uh, yes, I've got a bunch of ideas for inspiration. I know it's not a popular um, game mechanic, but there there are game mechanics that are very similar that are quite popular. So we're going to sort of look at that. So yeah, if you want to talk about cover or any other game mechanic, I'm quite happy to go into that. Let's, so let's do inspiration. Probably one of the most contentious and poorly used game mechanic out there now whether you call it inspiration in dungeons and dragons 5e uh, whether you call it action points because you're playing dungeons and dragons 4e or some other game system uh, mutants mutants and masterminds has stunt points um, fate has fate points there's also a thing called hero points and currently i believe pathfinder second Ed edition uses hero points they all really do the same thing okay whether it are inspiration, action points, stunt points, fate points, or hero points. In some way, the players can have their character do something awesome. That's the idea. It is something extra. It is a pool of, sometimes dice, but a pool of points that allow them to do something awesome, or to give them a mechanical benefit of some kind. That's essentially what it is. Almost all role-playing games have a system like that. It is so common whether you call it inspiration or not, it's called lots of different things. But every game system generally has a system like this. Why? Because it invests players into playing the game so that they have a, a get out of card, um, you know, get out of jail free card. Like when things go really bad and things aren't working well for them, they can play this card. And that's their, their hero points, their inspiration, uh, action points and so forth. So there's many ways that players could uh, gain inspiration. And um, I don't want to talk about necessarily just the way that the player's handbook talks about getting inspiration. Um, and for those of you who are unaware, in Dungeons & Dragons 5e, to, to earn inspiration, 
or inspiration points, you have to ha play your character, you have to play to the character's flaw. So that means you have to do something that disadvantage is going to be a disadvantage to your character by playing to your flaw that will usually result in a bad consequence. And by doing so, you get an inspiration point, okay? Or you get inspiration. And inspiration is basically you get advantage. You get advantage on a dice roll of some kind. The problem is, and I've always found this, and I don't know if everybody else has found this, is that players don't like doing that. But let's go into the other things that I think, and I've made a kind of a list of things that I give people inspiration for and what other people have given inspiration for. So I, I've given out inspiration for good you know, role playing. So, you know, playing their character really well. Not necessarily playing to the floor of their character, but I've done that. I've, I've seen game masters and I've done it myself. If they bribe me or uh, bribing the game master is like a, it's completely legit because you can award it for anything. So bringing pizza, bringing food, bringing in a beer, you know, something like that. Some sort of bribery is always always a good way to, you know, it's a good time to give out inspiration, okay, or hero points or action points or whatever. Uh, the other one is a character doing something risky. Now, the, it runs into the same problem. A character doing something that is risky means that there's usually an outcome for the player that is counterintuitive to what they're trying to achieve, which is, which is to be successful and not have their character die. And the problem of playing to a character's risk, which is certainly story-wise interesting and adventure-wise interesting, but again, getting a player to do that is very, very hard. And also, players acting to their floor, same sort of thing. It's not necessarily risky, but it's not necessarily going to give them the best outcome, okay? Uh, bringing food and drink to the table. Uh, there's are lots of different ways you can do it. I know some people just give out inspiration at the beginning of the session just for showing up. If you actually showed up at the table, you get inspiration. So there's lots of ways you could give out inspiration. And I'm sure you'll have your own ideas. By all means, share them with me. Hi, Eddie. How are you? Hate inspiration points. Corrupt system. So... So here's, here's my approach to um, dealing with this. And it's not actually how I, I it was, it's not something I did initially. Um, but bear with me, I, I've, got, I've got more to say about inspiration. Because inspiration is hated in 5e, yet if we look at Pathfinder, hero points are not hated. Fate points, I've played fate, fate points are not hated. Uh, if you're playing mutants and masterminds, stunt points are not hated. Action points are not hated. So why? what is it about inspiration that makes it not work? I'm going to get there. Um, so what might you wind up getting? So usually if you have inspiration or action points or whatever, whatever system you're using, there's a couple of things you're likely to get. And the first one is usually some sort of mechanical benefit. It's almost always some sort of mechanical benefit. So whether that is you get a re-roll, you get to re-roll some dice, okay, uh, that's quite common. Some sort of dice mechanic is usually involved. Maybe you're adding uh, another dice to whatever you're rolling for, for your main check or your main dice roll. Maybe you get an extra action. Like quite common is uh, getting an extra action. Players love that. And yet getting advantage a lot of people don't like that that much. It gets forgotten. <laughs> it gets forgotten. Um, granting advantage, okay, on a re-roll or just a, a plan out re-roll. I mean, re-roll mechanics are so common in a, a game, particularly D20 systems. But advantage or a re-roll, it's really the same thing. Uh, so you, you screw up your attack and you get to, to roll again. Oh, you, get, you get advantage. So you roll, roll the first attack, didn't come out right. Okay, there we go. And we roll again. Okay, all oh, right, well, the second dice wasn't as good. So I keep, I keep the first roll, you know. But if you rolled really, really low, it's, it's definitely a benefit. And then also, and this, and this is another way you can apply inspiration, action points and so forth, whatever you want to call them, is giving your ally, give them the inspiration, so that they can roll a another 20-sided dice or roll with advantage. So it's a re-roll or advantage of some kind. Giving it to your ally. 
when you don't really need it, but they do, can be really useful. Or forcing your enemy. So say the enemy is trying to make an attack on you. They swing, they try to bash you, and they get a 20. Like that's the worst thing you could possibly get, right? They roll a 20, it's a critical hit. Well, being able to force your enemy, if you've got inspiration, to take disadvantage, so roll another dice to get rid of that uh, that critical hit. Well, that, even if they still hit, it's at least not a critical, right? Unless, of course, you roll 220s, or the game master rolls 220s. But applying disadvantage to a, a, a dice roll is really useful. It doesn't even have to be an attack roll. It could be any kind of roll. It could be a saving throw. It could be an ability check or a skill check or whatever it is. Those are all good and well, but you know, the, the one thing that I've discovered after playing with my group is any time you roll a 20-sided dice, and then you've got to roll another 20-sided dice, and you just take whichever is the highest number, even though that seems like a, a good benefit, you know, it is beneficial, it doesn't seem to have the same kick as being able to roll another dice and add whatever's on that dice to the dice roll that you made with the 20-sided dice. This is something that um, my friend Simon had put forward, and this is how we were doing inspiration at one point. So any time we made a dice roll and we got a result that wasn't high enough, we didn't like it, we got to pick up a 10-sided dice, and we would roll that number of dice, and whatever we got on that dice, we got to add to the 20-sided dice. Mechanically, in terms of advantage and disadvantage, on a 10-sided dice, the average you're likely to get is about a five and um, five point five, okay. And if you if you look at it, you know mathematically, the the supposedly the 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 added bonus is you're probably getting like a plus five if you've got advantage. And I suppose you could just say, okay, if I have advantage, just give me a flat five and be done with it. But I can tell you now that in my group, we found that being able to roll a ten sided dice and add that result to a twenty sided dice we were much more likely to use inspiration. Even though you've got a chance of rolling a one or a two. And now I know it sounds strange, but it's 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 true. I honestly found that being able to roll an additional dice was really useful. And another, another system you can use, and this is very common, and it's not part of inspiration in 5e, and that is getting, to get, um, getting another main action. I don't mean a bonus action if you're playing 5e, um, I don't mean a minor action or a swift action if you're playing um, for, um, you know, 3.5 or you're playing um, uh, Dungeons & Dragons 4E or anything like that. Okay, What I mean is your main action. You call it a standard action or main action. It's just a basic action. So instead of being able to just attack once, you can attack twice. And you can use, of course, actions allow you to do lots of different things. So getting an extra action instead of just a one action one action, you get another one, hugely beneficial, and, and it's the sort of thing that people don't forget. They will use them. <laughs> they will absolutely use them. So there's a, a bunch of different things that I think inspiration fall into, uh, fall into a trap, and the way that we use inspiration in our games is part of the problem, and I don't think that the designers of 5e and then, frankly, uh, many game systems have actually taken this into consideration. And I want to present them. So you were waiting for pros and cons. I've actually got some big hitters coming up. How's it going, Prepare, Cook and Survive? How are you? Hello, all. Um, you've been watching while you're painting. You keep doing your painting, and I'll keep talking. I want to give it to my enemy uh, to hit all ally, um, any ally. I just like, <laughs> yeah, so, so one of the things I discovered is if you allow your players to apply disadvantage to an enemy with inspiration, they are much more likely to use it. I know that one of the arguments is that players don't use inspiration because they forget they have it. And, and I would say that's actually not really true. That's sometimes the case. But what I've found, if you're playing something like Dungeons & Dragons 5e and you get to about level 5, you find you don't really need an advantage. Unless you're a rogue and you don't have advantage for your sneak attack, you really don't need it. So you don't bother rolling it. I've had this said by people in my group all the time. Um, I don't use my advantage because I didn't need it for the... I, I'm a, we, were, we were strong enough, you know. Um, 
you might have thrown something that was, uh, you know, quite tough for us to fight, but we're so powerful, we really don't worry about anything. Now, my group is full of power gamers, okay? So it's a very different animal, but, um, well, most of them anyway. But one of the things I've discovered is it's not just they forget, it's just they don't need it because, one, they're already doing pretty well, and it's it's rolling another 20-sided dice. And sometimes you get something good, and sometimes you don't. The, the problem with rolling two 20-sided dice and having advantage... The biggest problem is the second dice is not necessarily going to give you a better a better result, you know? And it's also the timing around it. Like, if I roll the first dice, am I allowed to roll the second dice after I know the result of the first dice? And so we have this timing problem. And then what happens if we have advantage, but then something else has disadvantage? When is it, how do we know, particularly if you've, already rolled with advantage and then somebody remembers oh you've got disadvantage as well oh, okay which one of these two dice do we take timing is really important right when are you applying dice but the the biggest problem is always when you roll two 20 sided dice rolling two 20 sided dice doesn't necessarily give you a th- the feeling that you're actually getting a benefit because sometimes you can roll really low on both dice but if you roll pretty low on one dice and I get a one. What if I get a one on a 20-sided dice and I roll a second dice and I get a one again? It means I rolled snake eyes and even though I got to roll two 20-sided dice, the best result as I got was a one. Whereas if you roll a 20-sided dice and you roll a one, but you get to roll another dice like a 10-sided dice or a 6-sided dice, you will at least get a one on that dice that you can add to the other result. So your lowest number is not a one, it's a two. That's the worst case scenario. So you always add a, it's always more beneficial to roll another dice to add to that number. And this is why I'm putting this forward. How's it going, Charles? Charles Butler is a patron. Thank you for being here. I would give inspiration to my um, players every time they show up before the official start time. And when two other players thought... Another player deserved it. And and so so the, just showing up at the table, sh- you know, getting them to show up on time is re- really important. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. <laughs> showing up to the game is a big factor. Showing up to game. I'm just going to make a note of this so I just don't forget it. I, I mentioned it, but I didn't write it down. So... So that's but that's the one of the things I wanted to say. Unlimited power. Uh, oddly, they they seldom use that uh, second um, option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I'd quit D and D if I rolled two ones uh, on a roll for a D twenty. Yeah. <laughs> See, so here's here's the thing I'm going to suggest to you, and we've been doing this recently, and um, and we've tried a few different things. Banking inspiration. Game masters always terrified that somebody will bank all their inspiration and then blow it all at once and so their their main battle will suddenly be troused by everybody rolling advantage on everything they do okay which is totally possible i don't like banking inspiration i don't like banking action points hero points uh fate points anything like that you know why because it allows for that sort of that uh, that power move that supernova but one of the things that I noticed Simon did not so long ago, sorry, one of the things I noticed that Simon did not so long ago is he said to us, look, any time you do something that you want to do with your character and it's risky and I think it's quite risky to do it, okay, any time that you want to do that, I'm going to give you inspiration on any dice check related to that action. So if you do something that's risky but there's no dice roll involved, and there's no sort of bad outcome, there's no point giving you inspiration. But if we have to resolve the action by rolling dice, I'm going to give you inspiration for doing that. You don't get to bank inspiration. I'm telling you, you are using the inspiration for that particular dice roll. You're going to try to sneak by the, uh, the monsters all by your lonesome, and there's nobody else around, and you're dealing with a, a great a great ancient red dragon 
Uh, and if you fail, the chances are it's going to breathe fire on you and eat you. Okay, I'm going to give you inspiration because it's cool. Or if you decide you're going to jump off a building onto a, a flying ship. And I think that's just awesome. Or fly and um, jump off a building onto a, a dragon and try to drive your, your sword into it. Chances are, that, you know, you could, you could well fail, fall to your death. So I want you to have a better chance of success. Now we were rolling two 20-sided dice and we've been doing that recently. But I want to point out that do it that way. Use inspiration at the moment that it makes sense. So when somebody does something that you want to give them inspiration for, don't tell them they can bank it and mark it down. Just tell them it applies to this dice roll. You eliminate the problem of people banking inspiration or whatever you want to call it. You eliminate the problem of them applying it to a dice roll that really doesn't relate to the action that they were they're, 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 it should be related to. You know, and uh, if, look, if they've done something that you like in terms of role play and then you want to re reward them and the next dice roll comes up, you know, like they've been rolling, role playing their character really well. They're interacting with the other NPCs. And now I'm going to make them make a perception, uh, not a perception or a uh, an insight check or a, a persuasion check. I'm going to give you an I'm going to give you inspiration because you're doing such a good job of role playing your character. L let's give it to you there on that dice roll to make your chances better at, at succeeding. I think this is one of the biggest factors that Wizard of the Coast has not considered is we should be applying inspiration to that particular situation, to a particular dice roll, and not leaving it as an asset or a resource that you can bank and leave for some other time. Uh, and as soon as you start using it that way, honestly, we don't have problems with people banking inspiration now. We don't have problems with people deciding to use it, you know. Uh, we run out of time. We, we, you got inspiration 15 minutes before we end the session and there were no dice rolls to apply it to. <laughs> and so you never got a chance to use it and now it's lost. Otherwise, you've got to bank it and save it for next time, which is completely unrelated to what we were doing before. So instead of looking at inspiration as a, a resource that you collect that the players get to use uh, any for anything, consider it as it's tied to a particular action related to what they were doing. And honestly, I think the results are much better. And again, get them to add a 10-sided dice roll to the 20-sided dice roll rather than rolling two dice. Uh, and you can do the same thing with, you know, um, disadvantage. You, you could get, you know, I want to apply disadvantage to the enemy in this situation um, and, and, you know, and you say, well, hang on, what are you doing? You're doing something that's risky. Um, it sounds really cool. It sounds really interesting. I want you to succeed, but the chances are, even though it seems like it's a great idea, it may not work. So um, you want to, uh, we can we can apply, you know, a 10-sided dice roll and, and deduct whatever we roll on that 10-sided dice from the 20-sided dice roll that the enemy's making. So these are these are ways of doing this that it actually makes it work better. Um, I, I it's been my favourite way to apply inspiration in the game so far, is applying it then and there to the actions that were actually being taken at the time. Um, it doesn't always quite fall into that uh, that realm, but it's worked out much better. Any time we've had inspiration awarded at the beginning of a session and it's just been sitting in a pool waiting to be used, it tends to just sit there. <laughs> it just, just it just does. Um, would most of these examples be great cinematic rules for RPGs? I think they apply really well to any kind of RPG. Eddie, I, honestly, I think they apply really well to any kind of RPG. So that was actually all that I had to, I wanted to discuss today with regard to game mechanics. Um, I guess the other thing is like, it's also kind of good if you can if you can look at inspiration and say, does it have to be a, does it have to be a um, another second dice roll? You know, does it have to be a re-roll of a twenty-sided dice? Do we have to worry about rolling a dice and adding a number to that twenty-sided dice roll? I actually think there's there's a lot to be said for just allowing them to have a another action. You know, you can do a bit more in this in this situation. You're taking a big risk. 
I'm going to give you another action to do, particularly when it comes to combat. Outside of combat, it wouldn't really apply that much. But inside of combat, it makes a lot more sense. So being a bit more versatile in the way that you apply inspiration, I think the, the, real, the real weight behind uh, the inspiration process, the hero point process, uh, action points, fate points, whatever you want to call them, is the, the fact that you need to have more than way, one way of applying them as a game master to assist the players in what they're trying to do. Just my opinion. I wanted to put that out because I know it's, it's something, like every table runs inspiration differently. Some people don't even use inspiration anymore. They got so frustrated with the whole system. Some people have got their own way of doing things. Replace the die with a, fl um, a coin flip. Yeah, why not? Why not? 50-50 chance. Instead of a potentially one a one or a twenty roller on a dice, a, a coin flip would uh, would be would be a, another way of dealing with it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to actually finish there today. I want to see the poll uh, and see what we've got in terms of votes. Uh, do you use now? This is interesting because we were talking about cover not so long ago. Do you use cover rules in your role playing games? Yes, seventy five percent. Not really surprised. No, twelve percent. And then what are cover rules? There we go, 12%. So that means that there are 25% of you who don't use cover rules or don't even know that they exist. And so, um, and you're, you're playing your game fine. <laughs> now, some game systems don't have cover rules. For example, Shadow Dark, there are no cover rules. Um, so you're not really applying any kind of cover rule there. Why Why did Kelsey do that? I'll tell you why. It's because it's just another headache. Uh, <laughs> but you can have, I mean, Shadow Dark uses uh, the token system. And the token system is the ability to re-roll a dice. Uh, and a token is there specifically because there are a lot of things that you could wind up doing and failing uh, when you need to be able to change that result. So I, I actually think that um, inspiration doesn't work very well in 5e because as the game, when you're starting off, the game is a, is a little bit harder, but it's really quite a lot easier to play once you're about level 5 or 6, just the power shift. Shadow Dark is pure love. I, I, I like Shadow Dark in many respects. Um, I believe Wally was telling me that Shadow Dark to him felt like he was playing Beck Me Dungeons and Dragons or basic D and D. And I have to agree, since I have now played Shadow Dark and I have now played Beck Me or Basic D and D, which I hadn't played before, I would say it does feel very, very similar. Um, so yeah. Please let me know uh, if there are some types of uh, complex game mechanics you would like to talk about in the future. I've only prepared those two because those are the two that I sort of had time to put together. I'll certainly come back and we'll talk about other things. I am going to shuffle off uh, and get on with my day. I'm probably going to be heading over to Discord. So for those of you who have time and want to come and hang out and chat for a little while while I'm mucking around doing stuff, you're welcome to come and hang out with me while I muck around and get some stuff done before I go to work. Uh, if you're not really interested, hey, thank you for, for coming in the first place because yeah, without people here, it wouldn't. It would, I'm just talking to myself, aren't I? Really. <laughs> all right so there's the discord link for those people who are here who would like to jump in if you're already there you already know the the the, the link anyway so i'm done for today i want to say a big huge thank you to my patrons who support me on patreon so that i can run this system uh run this program every every week every week now next week i'm going to come back and we'll do magic i've got a few different ideas for magic kind of a bit revolutionary for i guess for a lot of people but um that's that's how i like to be <laughs> magic is one of my my pet peeves and, and pet loves so thank you for watching thank you for taking part in the poll thank you for listening and providing your your input thanks charles and eddie uh matt and fred for uh for putting in your uh, your comments um so wherever you are in the world whether it be the morning the afternoon the night or the wee wee early morning please look after yourself your family and your friends be nice to your neighbors and hey, till next time, why not try a different way of doing things in your complex combat encounters? And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.